Okay, hey, uh, hello everybody, good morning. Uh, I may welcome you to the first talk today. And this is a science track. This is a new feature on the FrostCon. We want to have more science-related talks. And this is the first one in this uh, series. And I may introduce to you Mr. Carsten Thiel. He is a, a mathematician uh, and he has studied in, uh, uh, I must look, uh, he studied in uh, Göttingen, yes, genau, Göttingen, and uh, he made his PhD in Magdeburg, and he's now in uh, Niedersachsen at the Staats and, uh, University, nee, Staats und Universitätsbibliothek uh, in Hannover, Göttingen, Göttingen, okay. And he is there at the uh, supporting science work, especially the um, non-technical science, and so we are very interested in your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I want to talk about our endeavors into research infrastructures. Um, so he already said I'm working in IT infrastructure in digital humanities at the State University Library in Göttingen. And uh, what I'm presenting here is what we did in the Sandari project, uh, where we did technology work together with the French uh, Research Institute INRIA, King's College in London, the Serbian Academy of Sciences, us at the SUB Göttingen, and Trinity College in Dublin, so rather international uh, group of uh, IT people. The project ran from 2012 to 2016 uh, under funding by the European Commission. Um, research infrastructures as defined by the European Commission refers to facilities, resources, and related services used by the scientific community to conduct top-level research in their respective fields. So in our case, that means web services, web interfaces that users can use to advance their research. Distributed, in this sense, means that we have components that are running at different institutions that are connected through either APIs or at least through centralized user authentication so that users can switch from one application to the other and continue working on their data. Um, in the humanities, we have a high variety of research questions from historians, which is the main focus group of this talk, of this project, uh, to people working on literature studies, languages, and so on. And there are lots of special purpose solutions for every single one of those questions, research questions, research problems. And there's a strong focus on word processing. So quite a lot of what they do, they do it in Microsoft Word. Um, and one problem that this project was trying to address is access to resources that are held at various cultural heritage institutions, archives, libraries, and so on. Um, Sandari is a project that uh, built a virtual, virtual research environment targeted at historians. The term was originally an inquiry environment for research into historian studies. One aim was to integrate existing resources, existing sources around uh, Europe, enabling access to so-called hidden archives. Many archives are still not uh, accessible, well, their contents are not accessible through the internet. Very often, even the archives themselves don't have web pages where you can find much information about them. So they are uh, very hard to find stuff that you want uh, for your research. And one traditional problem of a historian is he's traveling to some place in the next month uh, to visit a conference. And so what he would like to know is, is there an archive in the area that has something that relates to my research problems? And while I'm there, I could go to that archive and look at that material. And that is really a hard problem still to find out what archives there are and what they actually have in terms of content. Um, fostering transnational access. So again, it's a European project, so we're working together collaboratively around Europe, and one idea also is to have people from one country go to other countries and find resources there. Um, the project had 14 partners from eight European countries, uh, among them humanity scholars, computer scientists, cultural heritage institutions themselves, archives, libraries. Um, and we had two main uh, focus areas. One was World War I, the other one was medieval research. 
which are quite different from all of the content and questions they have, and also from the material available. So in medieval research, you have one page that's uh, a lot, whereas for the uh, First World War, you even have videos and things like that available sometimes in the archive. Very often not digitally. This is one view at what the application can do in the end. On the left, you have your project tree, and in the middle, the text you're working on, which can be a transcript of a document from an archive, a scan, an image that you have. Um, and what you see in the colors are uh, results of the named entity recognition uh, applied automatically and then edited from the researcher, by the researcher. Uh, the colors indicate uh, people, places, um, places are blue, people are red, uh, and you see the um, list of people here. You can highlight them. If you uh, hover over these bars, then they pop up here. Uh, you have, it's not that visible, but this is a map where you see the places that's currently selected um, on the map. Um, and people can share these projects with each other, work collaboratively on them, uh, and at some point maybe even decide to make it available publicly. Um, and it's all happening in the web browser. From the technical side, it looks a bit different. Um, that's what we've been focused on. Um, I'll explain this in a few minutes. Um, so I said the project ran for four years. And first, I'm going to tell you how we started out. And then I'm going to tell you well, how we tried to fix some of the problems we had. Um, we started out with one virtual machine where everyone was playing around. Everyone had access, everyone had pseudo rights, everyone did what they thought was the best idea, um, which didn't work that well because everyone was interfering with everyone else. Um, someone broke uh, one config and nothing else worked. So we started to have more machines. Uh, every team had their own machine playing around. Um, it caused less interference, but uh, things started to grow apart. Um, also, there was a long trial and error phase. Many, many different things were tried out, installed, removed, or partially removed, or just abandoned and left running for months or years. Um, we also did manual EAD encoding. EAD is a standard for uh, archival description. That's an XML standard. So people were manually writing, and I'm, when I say people, I mean historians, scholars. They were manually encoding XML files, tracking them in SVN. So they first had to learn how to write an XML file, then they had to learn how to use SVN. Uh, they did use Oxygen, sorry, not open source, but um, the things that happened was that they wanted to have an object with two IDs. Oxygen said, no, you can only have one ID on an element in this XML file, but, well, the historians know better. They want two IDs. Um, which led to lots of problems later when we tried to actually pass those files and uh, make them available in the interface. There was also a phase where we tried Semantic Media Wiki as an editing software because, well, it's... MediaWiki, which is basically Wikipedia. Everybody knows and uses Wikipedia, so that's easy. And also, it's semantic, so we got all these super great semantic features. Yeah, well, that doesn't work automatically, and uh, it's no magic. You have to actually do something, and that was more complicated than what was originally hoped. So I said things grew apart. We had Slash machines, Ubuntu machines, Debian machines. We had a Slash machine with a, Ubuntu, with a Debian change root because you know that one package that isn't available for Slash but Debian and it's easier to install a Debian change root and then install the package from there because upgrades and all, but no one was doing upgrades in the Debian change root because all those people who were doing upgrades to the system, package upgrades, didn't even know there was a Debian change root on there where they had to look into. So it was basically the same as installing from source. Um, we had applications installed from packages. We had applications compiled manually, directly on the server. Um, again, things that people once did, 
completely forgot about it, never wrote it down, never told anyone else, left the project. Um, and in terms of standards, well, installing from source, usually that doesn't give you automatic uh, backup routines and things like that. Even packages don't usually get you automated backup routines. Um, so init scripts were missing when uh, servers were rebooted for various reasons, power outage in the data center or whatever, um, where we had to write an email to that one developer who knew how to start that what database on that development server. Um, and there were lots of experiments. So one example is, uh, this is the actual URL they started to use for the reference to the EA, to this uh, schema file with an IP address hard-coded in it. Um, yeah, that's not very sustainable. And that became a problem even before the end of the project because we switched IPs for some reason. Um, collaboration, well, we had kind of shared responsibility. One was responsible for the one server and the other one was responsible for the other server. But um, in terms of the application, it was not so clear when we started building, putting them together. So at first there were several silos, several applications all working on their own, but we needed that to combine them and that started to cause problems because everything was so very different. Um, again, documentation, incomplete, sometimes lacking. Big risk of silos and knowledge loss, in particular knowledge loss because it's a research project where most of, many of the people at least, uh, that are paid to work on the project, usually the advisor who's a professor at some institute, he is not exactly paid by the project because he has his salary, but uh, then he has the grant money to pay his PhD students who sometimes finish their PhD and then leave, or even leave without finishing the PhD. So sometimes in the middle of the project, the one developer who knew something is suddenly gone to SAP. Um, and then it takes two weeks to f actually find the source code he wrote. Um, so we looked at something else, DevOps, the big uh, buzzword, clipped compound of devo uh, development and operations, a culture of movement, a culture or movement or practice that emphasizes collaboration and communication. Uh, while automating the process of software delivery and infrastructure changes. That's what the English Wikipedia says. So important are collaboration, communication, and at the same time, automation. And that's what we tried to use to fix at least some of the problems we had. So when you have a research project across Europe with people from, I said, France, Britain, Germany, Serbia, um, and then they're working people who are from yet different countries. Um, you have all those cultural clashes in terms of how you work, uh, what you think you should do or not. Um, and all of those teams were working independently because we're not a company that has a one goal or something. There's researchers who have their research projects and one of those projects is this Sendari project. Um, and the goal is to get something that works so that we can show it to European Commission in some sense. Of course, everyone wants there to be something that people can use that has an added value. But at the same time, the one thing you get paid for is to deliver something that's presentable uh, to the funder. Um, no matter how great it is. If uh, the funder, uh, the, the most important thing is that the funder approves of the result because then you get another grant for the next project. Um, so you have to have impact for your project to be valuable, but impact is not measured in the same sense as it is with big companies. Um, Going back to the DevOps word, uh, so what we did was include the building of the architecture into our agile development processes, um, which the teams had individually started to use, and we tried to combine them together into one uh, process. And we also defined this infrastructure in some sense. So what this picture shows is the front-end applications, 
Then we have in the middle our API layer that connects all the front-end applications to all the back-end applications, which basically uh, came down to two back-end applications from originally six, because we realized we don't need that many. Um, and then at the bottom layer, you have uh, things like databases and storage. And um, these are the core components, and these are some externally hosted services. I said it's a distributed infrastructure, so we have external services that are not part of this infrastructure that existed before we started creating this and exist independently. So one is this red box here, the NERD, uh, which does the named entity recognition and disambiguation. Um, it's hosted by the uh, French INRIA developers, um, and we're only accessing that through an API. But uh, these are all hosted internally, uh, and you can switch between the applications. Um, what are those applications? We have ATOM. It's an open source PHP application. Um, it stands for access to memory. It's what the uh, it's a standard application from the Open Archive Initiative that's used to encode archival descriptions where people can enter, well, there's an archive, this is the address, and this is what they have in terms of content. You can describe this, and what it puts out are those standard EAD files that we first tried to manually edit with an XML editor. Um, CCAN is a Python-based uh, repository software where all our data gets in. We have uh, half a million data sets, or a bit more than that, in there um, that were mostly harvested directly from archives through open standards uh, if it's co actual content. So we have uh, descriptions on item level, which means there's this image which shows that person uh, held at this archive. Uh, but we also have more global things than just basic uh, textual description of an archive and their holdings. This main application, NTE, note-taking environment, which was the image I showed you, it's forked from an application that's called Editor's Notes, Python based on, um, on Django. Then we have our very own application, the LeetF Conductor, that's the main um, back-end component that does all the transformations. Um, and we have Pineapple, which is uh, a browser for the triple store. We have an open virtuoso um, triple store in the back end, and this is a browser for that knowledge base. Um, we're using MySQL, Postgres, Redis, Elasticsearch, Open Virtuoso. Um, yeah. So, what we needed was a lot more communication a lot of automation, and as I said, we're not talking about scale, so we didn't need hundreds of those servers. Many times when you introduce automation, you need many servers. What we were interesting was um, defined state and reproduce reproducibility. Um, and what we tried to do in order to get more communication was uh, shortened print sprints, more releases, we went from, well, maybe one thing every six months to more or less weekly. We had weekly sessions with the developers and the historians who were using the current version of the software, talking about current issues, what were the next steps to fix something to get closer to what the application was supposed to do. Um, it was possible to directly create tickets directly from the application um, so that developers could say, well, this is just failed for that and that reason. Um, we introduced config management. We chose one Ubuntu version. So it was tr two years ago, so we chose Ubuntu 14. Um, we chose Puppet for config management. We set up a staging and a production environment, both managed through Puppet. Um, we used Jenkins to build the software. Um, and when I say build with PHP, well, there's still some processing of the uh, CSS files, SAS files, um, static files. Uh, and then we packaged everything as Debian files with FPM because they were very easy to version in terms of Puppet. You, really know, you easily know which version you have installed. You can easily go back to an older version if you need to. Um, 
And we did this even for static files like the documentation because it's just the easiest way to deploy your software. Um, so what's it look like? We have the developer with his laptop who then pushes his changes to GitHub, which then trigger a build in the Jenkins server, um, which creates the Debian package, puts it in an aptly Debian repository, and then we install it on the server. The server is managed by Puppet, for which we have our internal Chile project uh, code hosting. And from that, you can create a Vagrant machine on your local laptop again, which looks, well, identical to the uh, production system with the obvious differences of data, of things like passwords, host names, certificates. But up to that, it's identical. Um, and you can also test your software against latest version from other people locally if you want to, or you can just deploy them uh, push your changes to GitHub, it will go to the staging environment. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. We had lots of mostly virtual meetings because all across Europe it's very expensive to get people together, so mostly Skype sessions. Everything went into version control, uh, the code for the infrastructure. Everyone had access to everything. So still, every single developer was able to change the production puppet code, uh, was able to log into the server, manually do changes, which then uh, caused different problems, but they learned that was not a good idea. Um, we had automated builds and tests upon code push. We installed our applications from one uh, app repository. The infrastructure and the applications were developed together because this image I showed you of how the infrastructure looked like, this is like the 10th iteration. Uh, before that, we had much more backend applications. Things were moved around between, in this image, there's actually two, two front, uh, the, the, the front office server and the back office server, which hold two, di part, two different parts of the stack. Things were moved around. All these changes happened simultaneously to the changes to the application. Um, and also on the second level, whenever we had a new version of a tool deployed, we could also change, for instance, its config file or things like that simultaneously with the change of the tool. Um, we had the Vagrant machine, we had the staging and the production systems, and they all were basically identical except for data, which is very important because if you have a triple store with, well, a few hundred thousand triples and a triple store with a few billion triples, they behave very differently. Um, it's Elasticsearch is much more flexible in that respect, for instance, or databases. Um, yeah, I said it several times, we had two environments, the staging and the production environment. They were created by two different branches in our Puppet Git repository, which means we had one uh, staging branch. We first tried our changes there. When we were satisfied with the changes, we merged that into the production branch, and then those changes went into the production systems. Um, our packed repository actually had two, as it's called, components. The Jenkins uploaded the Debian packages always in the staging component, and that's what the staging server used to install the packages. It always installed the latest package available from that uh, component or branch of the repository and we wanted to, to deploy something to production, we just copied the Debian package from one part of the repo to the other, and then the production server would get that version too. Yeah, that allowed for coordinated changes, uh, new version of a component, and changes to its config file, they all happened together. Some things we learned. Um, very nice is the reproduce, reproducibility. We are now able to recreate the entire server from scratch if we need to or if we want to. Um, and if we need a test instance, that's something Puppet will, can do. It's not the case any longer that we need that one person who knows how to deploy that one piece of software who is unfortunately on current extended sick leaves and will only be back in a month, so everyone has to wait for him to return to, to continue work on the project. Um, in scientific terms, reproducibility of your software stack is very important. 
we have a defined state of the software, of the server, of the configuration. Um, in some sense, this is provenance data on the infrastructure. It's of course not entirely complete because depending on what level of uh, provenance you need, it's very important which version of which library you have installed, which we don't manage to that extent. So if you install an Ubuntu 14 today, there are differences to the Ubuntu 14 from two years ago. Well, biggest thing is uh, OpenSSL, which had quite a few changes over the years with drastic uh, results, which are not probably not that important to um, the applications that we're using, but still it's big changes in the infrastructure that we're not uh, entirely managing here. We had shared ownership in the sense that most developers don't really care about all those OpenSSL problems and which cipher uh, order you're implementing on the server and the NTP config and uh, what your firewall settings exactly are. The best firewall settings is everything's open because then the developer can access everything and uh, do what he wants. But they still want to change something in their application's config file, add a setting for a new feature, things like that. Um, and everyone was able to do that. And Puppet best practices can help a lot there. There is a talk about that tomorrow, I believe. Um, and so we were able to share these things. So developers didn't have to care about SSL ciphers and they were able uh, to, to set up their things themselves. And one thing is that the security settings like firewall and so on, they are important right from the start, even before you have all the user data in there. Because otherwise you end up with a situation where you never thought about it and then you have all the user data and suddenly you realize that you have big holes um, somewhere. Which is also something you have to take care of. Um, config management, it causes a lot of overhead. It's harder to set up a server with config management than it is to just do apt-get install and be happy with it. Um, you have to rethink how you work with your systems because you no longer SSH into the server to make a change. You make the change in your uh, puppet code that gets into the, you check that in with Git, then it gets deployed. Uh, and then hopefully the thing you wanted to happen will happen. Um, in some sense, it's a new programming language you have to learn. And by you, I also mean uh, system administrators who usually don't consider themselves developers. And now they have to do programming. Um, also in the sense that they have to use Git and workflows like branching, because I said we had two branches mapping to the different environments. Um, and so changing that one setting in that one file becomes much more complicated. Of course, now you change it on all the servers. So if it's only two servers, maybe it's faster to do it by hand. But um, apart from that research infrastructure, we have more of them. And uh, so NTP settings and things like that, they're identical on all. And if we want to change them on 40 servers, that starts to get more complicated than just doing it uh, by, when you're just doing it by hand. And also, Puppet and most config management systems also, they will undo what you did manually. So if the developer SSHs into the system and just changes a setting, or if the admin does it, just SSH into the system, change a small setting to be, um, to make something work, Puppet will revert that on its next run, um, and then it's broken again. So this led to some friction. Uh, people were afraid of the automation because they never knew what will happen next. Um, well, of course, we knew what it was going to do, but uh, the thing is that you can't over uh, see the whole uh, Puppet code unless you're actually working on it all the time. And um, when you're using config or system configuration management like with Puppet, then um, you don't end up with the defaults, for example, the Ubuntu defaults in some settings because the Puppet defaults are a bit different sometimes, and this can cause problems when you think, well, I just install the package and then everything works. Because with the default setting in the Ubuntu package it works, but not with the default setting that gets pulled in through Puppet, it won't work. Things like that happened and uh, took us some time to trace. 
And of course, always it's the problem with the automation because the automation does things it's not supposed to do. But the other thing is also some sort of automation. The, pub, the, the Ubuntu default, which is different from the SLES default, uh, may not be the best setting either. Also, the complaint that it's far too early to put everything into config management. You can use config management very well to configure NTP firewalls, Apache settings, but it's far too early to decide where the config file lives, uh, what's in the config file, um, things like that. It's far better to do that in the end, like when you have two days before the end of the project, and then we can think about this. Um, and I mentioned this before, for uh, system administrators, they usually don't, then see, don't see themselves as developers. So learning Git, learning GitHub uh, adds overhead there. One thing I've heard several times is, I don't know how to code well. I'm too embarrassed to show my code on GitHub. I can't possibly publish my little shell script that does something because it's just hacked together in a few seconds. The other uh, fear is that if we publish our configuration, everyone know how we set up everything in every exact detail and they will find all the attack, vector, attack vectors that we overlooked. Um, which is not entirely uh, wrong, but on the other hand, if you know what you're doing, and if you look at um, many other, um, so for instance, so yeah, if you know what you're doing, that's st still a problem, but uh, many people do it anyways, because many of these things you can find out if you know what you're looking for as well. Um, and there are, so I said, also that our puppet code isn't actually on GitHub for everything. Uh, for most of the configuration management, we're using an internal Git repository, which doesn't grant everyone access to it. Others do this, so the United Kingdom government has all of its puppet code completely available uh, on GitHub. Well, obviously, except for passwords and certificates and stuff like that. Um, how we did Puppet Code, so this is more Puppet specific. Um, first, we tried some custom abstractions which basically model this image of our infrastructure that I showed you. We had uh, these definitions of the front end machine and the back end machine, and on that were the components, our software that we installed, and they in turn relied on the resources like databases, Elasticsearch, and if we decided to switch uh, one component from one role from the back end to the front end or something, we just had to change one line. Um, and we had one module, in terms of puppet module, that we um, shared with the other research infrastructures we have, which sets up things like uh, uh, passwords and um, certificates, firewalls, and so on. But that's hard to migrate when, once the project ends because now you have two completely different Git repositories um, and you want to put all of this together. You want to make a change to things like uh, the SSL ciphers because latest uh, problems. Um, then you still have to go in and change it in several Git repositories, which still causes overhead. So we change that into what the standard is in terms of Puppet now, we have uh, basically one, um, one Puppet module that's on GitHub, which you can use to install the Sundari applications. Of course, it relies on our internal uh, app repository, which is available publicly. Um, and and um, it's open source and reusable. And we have these shared roles and profiles, which is the Puppet standard um, that we, we can use among all our projects. And, and through those, we pull in the, um, the SSL ciphers, firewall settings, and so on. Yeah, a bit on sustainability. As I said, one problem is that the project only runs for four years. Once the project is over, everyone moves on to their next research project, um, and people leave. But then now you have this application hopefully running. In the case of Sandari, we have about 1,000 users a month, which is a lot for a research application in the humanities. Um, now there are people who are using it, and there's data in there. 
So you have to keep installing software updates, package updates, security updates, um, to be sure that everything will continue working and that everything is still secure. You have to maybe look at the code to fix something. Um, and this is why we think, at least to some extent, this will help. It won't help us if there's a problem with the actual applications that our developers program, but it will at least um, give us some way of fixing things. I mean, those are pub, uh, Python PHP applications. If in two years' time we decide we have to move to a new uh, uh, operating system version, it's probably possible to recompile them on the new version uh, and reinstall it on the new system. Um, so the uh, hope is that this will uh, enable us to, to get that stage as well, but before that, at least we now have a, a, a centralized um, application which is integrated into our other projects. One of them is uh, called DARIA, the Digital Research Infrastructure for the Arts and Humanities. Um, it's a large European project that tries to uh, sustain some of these projects, some of these infrastructures, uh, keep them alive, keep installing uh, security updates, monitor them if something breaks like storage has disappeared, reboot the machine. Um, and if it's really broken, decide on whether or not there are enough users to decide and invest some uh, people time to go in and update things. And this became much easier with uh, this aligned config management where we had basically the very same layout and, and we had to know where to look if we wanted to change something there, this, we did this for Sendari and also for TechScript, which is a German uh, research infrastructure for, um, for literature research. Well, to come to the end, it does cost a lot of time initially, a lot of friction we also experienced. Um, but later it paid off because one thing we had was this feature of trusted automation. So we have one bug fixed in staging, and there's half an hour before this big workshop with 30 international historians coming in, and they all want to see how great the software is. But there's this one critical bug. We really need to get it down. Well, it's working in staging, so let's just deploy the reproduction because the last 30 times it worked as well, and that time it did as well. So that was one of the good end results. And with that, I'm open to questions. So the question was on the, we don't have a mic, so I'm repeating. Uh, we had, uh, the question was on named entity recognition and uh, what training parameters we have and how to implement them. Uh, and with the Puppet configuration, so the thing is that the named entity recognition is happening outside, so it's not managed by our Puppet code. Um, INRIA is still developing that. They originally did some training with um, Wikipedia texts. Um, which are a bit different from texts that historians write. So um, what they then started working on was, uh, so the, the interface has two steps. You click on a button and the automated named entity recognition runs through it, and then you can go in and fix the entities uh, and decide, well, this is actually not a place, it's a person, or this is a person you forgot. Uh, and that can, gets then fed back into the uh, named entity recognition to improve the results. Um, but in terms of the parameters, I mean, if it's contents of, so in theory, if it's contents of, um, of a configuration file that doesn't have to change dynamically, then you can manage it with Puppet. If it's something that uh, changes dynamically over time, then you can't change it with Puppet. So Puppet always gives you access to the configuration, but not to the data. It's really hard to manage the data. Um, so also what our Puppet code not does is to uh, if you set up a new server, it will not initialize any databases. You have to do that. There are scripts, and it deploys the scripts to do that, but you have to uh, manually decide to do it.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first question is a bit more on the change in mindset, and the second was on um, putting this to different locations, different setups. Uh, maybe on the second, uh, we have not yet. Of both of those, I said we have two infrastructures like this now, TechScript and Sendari. Uh, we always have one of those, but in theory it's possible um, to set it up again. And with TechScript, we are in fact in discussion with a group from Switzerland on exactly that because um, they really want to keep their stuff in Switzerland and not on servers in Germany. Um, in many cases, it's still easier to put it on servers that are at a university somewhere in Europe than to put it on Amazon AWS, for instance. But it's still, in sometimes, politically important to have it in your own country. Um, changing the mindset. Well, the problem is that it, it's very easy. You always know what you're changing in your config files. Sometimes you have installed your application <laughs> several times or your databases several times on, uh, on that specific version of an operating system and you just log in, you know exactly what the file is, you just write something in there and then you're done. Um, the problem that arises here is, I said we have two staging environments and there are differences like what password they use or which database they use where the server lives. And so you have to have ways to say, well, depending on if this code is applied on that server or on that server, it's different. Um, and, and these obstructions is what makes it complicated to change something. Um, you want to change one setting that's the same everywhere, that's probably very easy because you just open the file and write it in there. But it, if, if it depends on which server you're actually de deploying the thing on, then you have put in variables that are then uh, realized on the server depending on the host name, for instance, um, which creates a lot of overhead. And that caused a lot of friction because it was much more complicated to change something. Um, and also, once someone decided on something, well, that was it. And uh, so they were like, well, the code is all on GitHub. You can install it. There's a basic installation instructions, which included the uh, make file, which to compile static files required me to have an Elasticsearch instance running with the correct uh, Elasticsearch index set up. Because on a production service, that's anyway the case, so that's not a problem. And also on your development machine, you need that. But you don't need it on a Jenkins server. Uh, you just want to compile the static files. Um, and, and this causes a lot of friction because you have to change how you're working. You can't just have one single make target that does everything. Um, you need one specific make target to create the static files that don't have dependencies on things you don't really need to compile the static files. Um, and then in terms of deploying that, package that you create on the Jenkins server to your actual production server. You have changes. Um, at first, we had a Jenkins server that ran on Debian. Uh, and there's also some Node applications in there. And Node lives, well, I'm not entirely sure, but user lib and li uh, user bin uh, and slash just bin somewhere. There's a difference between Ubuntu and, and Debian, and that caused broken links and things like that. So these things are hard. Uh, and that took a lot of time initially. But as I said, it paid off in the end because it was easier to, comp to get a new version into production. No one was afraid to actually deploy that thing just half an hour before the workshop. That literally happened. Um, yes or no? Uh, so Jenkins did run the tests if they were in, oh, sorry, um, repeating the question. Um, if we're using automated tests, um, we're using automated tests, well, if, Jen if the, the script you run in Jenkins or the Maven target includes testing, then it will be run. But, well, the standard problem was it was way more important to finish the product than to finish the tests, which will cause us a lot of problem if someone has to go in and actually change something, yeah. Um, but during the project, it was more like the developer changed something, it worked on his machine, he deployed it to staging, it worked on staging, and he was 
sufficiently confident to push it to production. Yes. And initially, yeah. Well, in the end, we did. Uh, originally, so the thing is, we're using um, uh, why we're using different uh, operating systems in the first place. Um, so basically, every team got their machine and they did what they wanted. That was how this happened. Um, and the SLES came in because uh, the university data center we're using that was the default. Um, so they gave us SLES machines. Some people reinstalled it with a different operating systems, others didn't. That's how we ended up with the Debian change route on one of them. Yes. Acceptance, but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so acceptance by humanities researchers. So most of the development was done by uh, computer scientists, together with the researchers who joined us in those weekly test sessions who did the actual testing. Um, they did not so much work on GitHub. Um, what they did was uh, we originally had a JIRA instance where they were tracking. I said we had uh, these data from these archives in our repository and that they had, they had to go to those archives, talk to them, to let them allow us to have them into our database. Um, and there were agreements signed and so on. And uh, this they tracked from the beginning with JIRA. They had specifically, JIRA has this workflow engine where you can do things like that. So first step was person goes out to the institute. Once this is all done, the ticket gets moved on to the project coordinator who has to sign the paperwork with this archive. Then it goes on to the developer who does the actual harvesting of the data from them. Um, and when I said we have the ticket system directly in our application, that was also originally the, uh, originally the JIRA um, ticketing system. In the end, we put our tickets on GitHub because we no longer use JIRA. Um, and people, in that case, people needed to have GitHub accounts there to create the issues. But um, those three who were still creating issues when the project was basically uh, over, um, they kept doing that as well. But it was a hard process. Also, we had in the beginning when they were forced to use SVN, um, well, they did it. And they were manually encoding XML files. So when I joined the project and I learned that we had historians who had no idea what they were actually uh, trying to, to do with those XML files, why it had, they were just being told, well, it has to be this XML file, it has to be this standard, and then you have this validator. Well, and then things happened like ignoring validator uh, remarks, like you can only have one ID. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>